Stormwater Management Committee to order. My name is Kabir Sandhu. I'm serving as chair today in place of Don Galbraith. And uh, we have a short agenda today, but I would like to do two things. Number one, are we now called a commission by council? You are. You are the commission now. Congratulations, commissioners. Uh, pat yourself on the back for the promotion. Um, number two would be, um, I, we have a guest from planning here today to discuss with us a few new pieces related to our commission. There's a planning study that was done uh, that we were going to get an update on. So I'd like to push um, our gentleman, Dustin, to the front of the line so he can go on to his important business at the planning office. And if you don't mind, come on up. All right, I'm uh, Dustin Shane with planning, and uh, this is Logan. Let me know y'all wanted to hear about some research we're having done. Um, we're calling this our stormwater runoff complaint assessment phase one. Um, it's kind of a joint project between planning and Metro Water, and we're kind of shepherding the consultants, Kimley Horn, and their sub consulting partner, uh, Hawkins Partners, um, as they do the research. So um, it seems kind of like common knowledge that there's been more stormwater runoff complaints uh, in the city in the last decade or so. Um, this has come to the council's attention. Councilman Druffel came to us and said um, he wanted to, us to study this if we had some dollars to do so, and we did. Um, so the main thing we, that we're looking for with this is we need to get some, we're trying to get some hard data and see if we can actually pinpoint if there's some some one thing or combination of things that are that are causing this. So uh, we kind of brainstormed and came up with potential drivers that we're having uh, Kimley Horn look at. Uh, one could just be the state of our infrastructure. Um, it's a lot of it's old. Another thing which is kind of where we're really trying to hone in is, is potentially increased impervious area. And we identified, we worked with codes and uh, with stormwater to look at some of the um, some of the gaps that are in our permitting process for for treating impervious area, um, things like driveways, pools, and patios not requiring uh, grading permits sometimes. Also on the zoning end, um, the ISR, impervious surface ratio, there, there is none for one and two family construction. So the only metric there is building coverage. So as long as it's not a building, um, we're not limiting the amount of impervious area that you can do. Um, could be that there's just more intense storm events occurring. Um, also, we're seeing a lot of trees torn out and, and removed, and the stormwater credit that we have for retaining trees is rarely, if ever, utilized. So, Kimley Horn is, um, we identified four hotspot areas with them, uh, the nations, East Nashville, Green Hills, and Buena Vista. Um, we're taking data from two years, 2021 and 2022. Um, the first thing they did is they mapped the runoff complaint data. So they used GIS and mapped all those complaints, found the hot spots. So now currently, and we have an update with them tomorrow, they're going in and they're plugging in um, state of the infrastructure, tree coverage, um, stormwater grading and single family permits that are in the vicinity, slope data, uh, watershed areas and then in any other impervious area. Um, so they're going to try to correlate all that data with the complaints, see what correlations there are. Um, and then they're also doing some deep dives and they've already given us a few examples of places where you had a 900 square foot home and now there's two 2,000 square foot homes plus uh, two paved driveways plus the removal of three or four old mature trees. Um, so all that's currently legal, but you could see how immediately that would increase uh, your, your runoff that you're going to see in these areas. So, and, and a lot of the problems we're seeing is just clogged, uh, ill-functioning infrastructure, but is it failing because it's working harder? So that's, that's a question we're asking. Um, Hawkins Partners, they are doing kind of the code part of this assessment. So they're looking at uh, some peer cities, Atlanta, Austin, Raleigh. Um, they're doing a deep dive into all the zoning codes and looking at them, look at comparing them. Um, so preliminary results, like I said, there's some gaps in coverage that we have that some of our peer cities don't, um, like 
there's a threshold of 800 square foot uh, below which you don't have to get the single fam the uh, stormwater single family permit for, for stormwater mitigation. Um, and then also there are those, there's those gaps in permitting things like driveways and pools and stuff. Um, Austin and Raleigh, just preliminary results, we're seeing that they work on like a district basis. So it's so we work, we in Atlanta work on a um, property by property, and you're you're responsible for a certain amount of runoff from from your property. They work on a district basis, um, and, and are kind of looking at the sum total of runoff that in an area, which allows them to impose more uh, things like ISR restrictions on one and two family because you know they're looking at this kind of sum total of, of runoff. Um, so are, are some of the gaps in our coverage, are they creating a cumulative effect in neighborhoods? That's that's one thing we want to know. Uh, back to Kimley Horn, like I said, they're looking at the major storm events and seeing if there's correlation there. Uh, because, you know, the infrastructure is, it may be working as it should, but it's just handling more stormwater than it was designed for. Um, and then they're going to come out with some recommendations at the end of the report. Do we need to tweak the zoning code? Do we need to have more ISR controls for, for one and two family? Um, Infrastructure investment, that's probably something we need to do anyways, but is that is that an issue? Uh, and then stronger tree protect protections, uh, should we make it worth people's while to preserve these big old trees which capture so much runoff? Uh, and so we're looking at the report being finalized in late September, and hopefully here in the next couple of weeks we'll have really a good picture of what the issue is uh, even before the, the report is finalized. So just one last thing. Um, They've kind of ruled out active grading permits because they're not seeing much correlation with active construction sites. So that may be an indicator that the measures we use when uh, a site is under construction are effective. Uh, they're not seeing much based on like watershed correlation. It's more like clusters of lots in each watershed. And like and finally, the vast majority of the complaints are maintenance related, like clogged uh, inlets. Um, swales needing to be redefined and so forth. But like I said, that could be because all the stuff is working harder because there's more runoff. So we're still kind of trying to figure out how to interpret a lot of this and they're going to they're going to get us that information soon. So um, be happy to answer. Like I said, this is a work in progress, um, but ha happy to answer any questions you might have. Mr. Shane, that's a tremendous effort, and uh, you're hitting on some key points that I think pull on our heartstrings on this committee here, especially when we look at uh, some of the pure city reviews. I liked what you had done in Austin and Raleigh where, you know, I feel like in Nashville, we've been playing man defense and we may, may need to switch to zone defense the way that um, Austin has done. And um, that's one thing we actually, I think Commissioner Fulmer brought up last meeting is that the, a lot of the problems we're seeing in flooding is not necessarily related to the commercial projects, it's the residential infill work where we're going from one single family home on a large lot to two. And uh, I think we had a couple of cases last time that uh, the neighbors showed up with uh, complaints of being flooded downstream. And, and that's part of the zone uh, defensive strategy that I think you're, you're headed towards. Any other thoughts on that from our commissioners? Okay, great. Any other questions? So, it, would it be possible for the commission to receive a, um, a, a draft copy of that uh, prior to its issuance? Yeah, absolutely. We'll, uh, we'll circulate that. Outstanding. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Okay, great. All right. We, we will move on to our... Uh, regularly ordered schedule of business. The second item on our agenda is to review and approve uh, or comment on the uh, meeting minutes and decision letters from our July 6th meeting. As customary, I would entertain a combined motion for both. But first, I would like for our commissioners to take a moment to read through those meeting minutes and decision letters.
Okay. I would move to um, approve the meeting minutes and decision letters as submitted. Great. We have a um, motion and it's been properly seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstained? Seeing none, motion carries. Okay. The second item of business, I believe, is our modified agenda today. We have one case. Let me make sure. Is that correct, Logan? Okay. One case today. And um, I'm going to try to find my agenda here with the case number. Here we go. Uh, great. It's uh, case number 2023. 00007 Dutch Brothers Coffee at 2381 Elm Hill Pike is the applicant here today. Wonderful. Come on up and um, we'll hear your case. I will give you a rundown of, of how this will work. Um, uh, Logan will read you your Miranda rights and uh, you'll give a two minute presentation and then uh, we will we will close the presentation and open public hearing and uh, receive any comments that may, we may have received Then we will close public hearing and then open it up for the committee to discuss and uh, develop a vote. So with that, I'll turn it over to Logan. Opening statement to the applicant. If you are not satisfied with a decision made by the stormwater management committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiori with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Case number one on the agenda is case 2023-00007, Dutch Bros Coffee, Elm Hill Pike, 2381 Elm Hill Pike. APN is 09515. 000700. Inspector is Linda Kelly, Council District 15, Jeff Syracuse. Applicants request disturbance of the Zone 1 and Zone 2 floodway buffer to construct parking areas, pervious pavement, and concrete, curbs, and stormwater infrastructure as necessary. For impervious areas to remain in the floodway buffer as proposed, continuous mowing and maintenance of portions of the floodway buffer, relocation of buffer signage as necessary. Appellant is JBDS V LLC, represented by Ryan Turner, Reagan Smith. Comments, stormwater staff. This project represents no additional buffer disturbance than what was approved on their past variance per buffer regulations at the time of that project. Code said no comment provided. Planning, no comment provided. Greenways, no comment provided. Great. At this time, please proceed with your presentation. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, this project that we're looking at is an old um, jack-in-the-box restaurant um, and it was built in the 2000s at some time, I'm not quite sure, and they had a retaining wall um, throughout the, the southern portion of the site along the Sims branch and <clears throat> um, our proposed project is to come in and um, demolish the building and then install a new um, Dutch Bros. Um, coffee shop. Um, we plan to pretty much reuse and keep in place all of the stormwater infrastructure as it is. Um, but since the original construction to now, the floodway has been redefined and is much wider. And so the buffers now kind of cross our property quite a bit. And so basically, um, we're just asking to um, do construction on the site that's already been developed and we're not going to um, do anything that's like below the retaining wall or that's in the, the floodway as it as is shown um, below the wall. But um, the site is in the like in the floodway buffers above the wall. So the work that we're doing up there would be within it. Is, is there a presentation with the screen with the, the plans? We lose that. IT team. So I 
think you had a pretty thorough packet. I'd love for you to maybe walk us through some of these pieces, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Yep. And give, give us your name. I'm sorry, we, we didn't. My name is Ryan Turner. Great, Ryan. With Reagan Smith. Thanks, Ryan. So, um, here's our our grading and drainage plan. Um, so this is the stream as we go. So we have a, a driveway connection with a, a bridge culvert going over the stream that's already in place. And um, this portion on the southern side is the retaining wall um, along all the way around the trash enclosure and around that side of the parking. And so basically everything below the wall we're going to leave as is. And then um, the modifications we're making are basically um, starting at this corner of the parking. Um, we're going to replace the building. Um, and in, in order to, to provide the water quality treatment, we're going to do um, pavers on the parking and the new drafting lanes that we've established. And <clears throat> this, this dashed line is the floodplain. And we, we have some grading within the floodplain, but we have uh, no, no added fill material in the floodplain, so it remains the same as well. Okay, so the existing pavements that were part of the original variants that are within the zone one and two buffers will remain? Yes. So whenever we originally reviewed the zone, this is the zone one buffer and the zone two buffer where they were more down here where the wall is. But since the flood wave has been widened, those then were pushed closer to our, our site. And so we are within flood way but for zone one and zone two on the proposed work. Do you know if the detention pond's still there? previous page, um, it is almost completely within the floodway. Um, so on our proposed site, we're reducing the impervious area. So we don't plan to like increase the runoff in any way for to have to modify the detention area. And we're also adding pavers and that was reduce the runoff as well. I'll try to bring us back to the order of the meeting. Was, was there anything else as part of your presentation for the committee? Okay. All right. We'll close the presentation. Logan, do we, do we hear, do we have any uh, letters in support of and our position of or any emails? No, we, we had no contact on this case. Okay. Is there anybody here in support or in opposition? Great. Okay, great. <laughs> Would, would you mind coming up for record to state your name and, and your, um, yes, please. But he's not working. Oh, thank you. My name is John Baker. I'm the property owner and, uh, obviously in support of the application and the, I, I'm clearly not an engineer, so I'm way out of my league here. But the one thing that I do find interesting about the project, the infrastructure was uh we didn't build the project my partner and i bought it uh four or five years ago if that but when inspecting the project i was taken by how uh, uh how well the improvements had uh you know weathered the 20 years since it was put in i've never i've done hundreds of projects i'm a developer <clears throat> mostly single tenant projects kind of like this one but i didn't have anything to do with this one i've never put a bridge on a project and when I saw this project and the infrastructure that the original developer had put in place, I was um, I was blown away. I, and I know it could never be built today. N no way would the economics allow this type of use to, to, to uh, entertain this kind of improvement. So we were really encouraged when we saw it. We didn't realize this was going to be an issue uh, when we were talking to Dutch Brothers. But 
again, from a layman's standpoint, to see something 20 years old that is in as good a shape as it is with the kind of dollars that were put in back in that time, we were encouraged. So, wonderful. Any, any questions for Mr. Baker from the commission? Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I'll close public hearing and open it up to the members for discussion. When looking at your plan, um, are there any additional plantings or vegetation buffer that would be going in? Uh, <clears throat> yes, we have uh, the landscape plan and, and I'm not sure if this is the, the mitigation plan, but um, there's a, a lot of existing vegetation below the retaining wall right now. And we're gonna add um, trees in the, the locations that we can, but um, just by looking at the plan, it's hard to tell what's already there. Um, but yeah, we do plan to add and mitigate as much as possible. Wow. I'm not quite sure. It's been multiple years, I believe. Can you um, point out on the plan, I'm having trouble getting mine to load, where the buffer, where you're proposing the buffer signage to go? So, um, basically the signage is going to go in front of the parking, um, right at the edge of the wall, mm -hmm. and then we'll put it along, um, there's a, there's a fence on the top of the wall, and we can put the signage on the fence as well, kind of showing that, like, the buffer is obviously low, but we can't like post signs in the middle of the lot. So mm -hmm. just do it along the edge of the wall and then just the parking number over there and then over here as so. well. Okay. Thank you. So there, there's two components of the signage. One's to make sure people don't get in there and clear everything out, but the second part's educational with People drive around this site. I think very few people would ever see that sign. And I don't know if, if that area is maintained today by the maintenance company or if it's just grown up. But I would be inclined to over on the side where cars are parking and queuing to have more of an educational component than just the stream buffer do not disturb sign. And because uh, people are going to be sitting there and <laughs> just park. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I'd, I'd be open to reducing some, you know, the number amount, I don't know how many are on the plan, but and in, in having more of a grander educational component. Stan, can you pull the plan up that shows the layout? I'm sorry to make you go back and forth. I think that's a great idea. I'd love to see and provide some direction. Maybe. <laughs> And while Don's doing that, um, can you talk a bit about the, the existing uh, impervious versus uh, now pervious areas? I think we're improving mm -hmm. so, the site substantially from what it was before. Yeah, existing was about 30,300 square feet of impervious area, and then we're going down to um, 29,700, so about 600 square feet reduction. But that, that assumes the pavers as being impervious. So there's yes, a, yes. Yeah, I feel it now. You know, so it, it's an increase of green space, but you're also adding all those pavers. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, and basically all of the asphalt that we're disturbing um, and regrading, we're going to turn into pavers. The rest of the asphalt, like um, Plan South, um, we're just going to mill and resurface. We're not going to like dig down and try and regrade that area because we just want to improve the condition. We don't need to adjust the way it's designed. And so most of the, so the, the pickup window will be there on that part of the building. So a lot of the, the queuing will occur around and then back up and, and probably end around in here. And so that's where most of the cars will be. If you go to the layout and you'll see them. Seems D Dutch Brothers is planning on this to be a very busy, uh, long queue location. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, they, on um, most of their stores, they, they plan for at least 20 um, space available just in case. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Any other questions from the committee? I think we've got one amendment to the proposal related to the signage. Um, I have a quick question. Would this, do you consider this redevelopment under Appendix B of, uh, of the Metro's form water volume? Um, Appendix B being the, the, I'm sorry, I'm not as familiar. The just the redevelopment definition, I think, is what's located in Appendix B. Yeah, I think so. We're yeah, we're assuming uh, it's a redevelopment, so we can get the redevelopment credit for the stormwater runoff reduction on our LID treatment. We're looking at the queuing location in the menu board and where cars would actually place their orders part of the amended potential motion for signage locations. Can you point to where the signage or the menu board locations are? Is it that dot, that white dot? Line. And we have these these striped areas. These are for the they call them runners. They're basically employees that are out in the drive-through lanes collecting order, collecting orders as they get backed up, and so they can just drive up to the window, pick up, and go. And so they can they can place orders as far back as these lanes go. But that will be the signage that we have. We have one median here, and then the two. The, the portion of the buffer closest to McGavick, like on the right side of your parking lot, you're planning to leave that natural as well? As on the, okay. The way the mod is drawn now, we're basically just straightening out this, this edge slightly and um, maintaining the, the grades that are, that are there. And we're not, we're not doing anything to the, the grass over there. Are there any additional comments from staff during the meeting that we should consider? Um, I think one of the things we looked into, and I think you had questions, was what were the circumstances of the original variance? Because this site was approved uh, sort of in the early stages of our stormwater program starting to evolve a great deal. Um, 
so we took that into consideration and that answered a lot of questions about how the site did get developed the way it did. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think the only post construction control for this site was the dry pond. Is that correct? So that's obviously now it's a different time and this site would have to meet post construction. Um, and speaking to your question, I think generally speaking, if a site's demoed to be rebuilt, that's development. But if they are renovating to be, uh, you know, come under the redevelopment criteria, that's the differentiation on that. So that was that was the discussion we had in evaluating this. So do, does Storm Martin, do we consider this redevelopment or does your department consider it redevelopment? I would assume, are you demoing the entire building and building it up from the ground? Then it would be a development yeah. site and it would, those uh, regulations would apply. And then I feel like it should be noted that the previous approval <clears throat> allows the drive aisles to be in locations that would not be approved otherwise. And, and they're taking good measure to leave that in place to not have a lot of erosion go into the creek. So I'd, um, I'd, I'd like to make a motion to approve with the condition of educational signage on the right side, on the outside of that drive lane that explains how since the original development was built it you know buffers have been enacted and this project improved the the prior non-compliance um, and just provide some sort of information um, and then that can be coordinated with staff great we have a we have a motion second properly seconded any further discussion i will say this is the this is the mill creek watershed Correct. No. Okay. Exactly yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have the um, our endangered crawfish species that have a spawning period sometime in the fall, September, October time frame. Is that correct, Rebecca? You, you know the spawn periods of our endangered crawfish. I'm I'm not privy to when they get it on. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. I just want to make sure that, as Mr. Fulmer pointed out, that we have um, a proper risk control and sediment protection measures to ensure that we don't have um, uh, runoff coming into our stream that have that are habitat for our endangered crawfish. So, any further discussion? Well, I just would say I, I think there's overall going to be a reduction of the impervious surface area, and it looked like a reduction in the runoff coefficient, which I think is important to note. Thank you for that, Brittany. Any further? Great. We'll cast a vote. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none. Abstained? None. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Turner and Mr. Baker for showing up. All right. That was our one case today. I think the other person, the other case uh, deferred to sit the next meeting. Is that correct? Or yes, they'll be back next meeting. Must have had to um, reload their arsenal. Are there any other, I'm trying to go back to the agenda. I wish we could, uh, can I make one small request while I have the, the, the chair seat to maybe add a numerical order to each one of these, like zero one for the agenda so that it shows up on our first click. Am I being very needy? I probably am. Before the, before the SWMC, but uh, yeah, I can try to do that. Um, so the, the reason that I, label them all SWMC is because we have to put them on our FTP site and mm -hmm. upload them on the tablet. So that way they get separated out from everything else. Only for the agenda would be my recommendation. Let's put the agenda he's first. Gonna, yeah, he's okay. going to have an hour of renaming five. Right, yeah, <laughs> don't, don't do that. It's, it's put an A or a zero one by the yeah. agenda. That okay. would be, yeah, that'd that'd be that. super so helpful. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right, great. That was... <laughs> um, 
All right, we took care of our Metro Planning Study overview. Is there any other business for this meeting? Mr. Hunt, I see you. Yes, um, I thought since it was short today, if I maybe could take a couple of minutes with Rebecca's help in helping me with factoids of giving a little bit more context to what planning covered. Please. Um, just historically, uh, Metro has had a very conservative grading permit threshold compared to most other cities of 10,000 square feet. Uh, that's been borne out by several studies over the years. Uh, so our grading permit, like they said, does seem to catch most everything and in a lot of instances can correct drainage issues by rerouting flows and putting quantity controls where there were none previously. Uh, but one of the things in the late 2000s that on grading permit sites and, and staff in our office are the ones who inspect those, started to get a lot of complaints from projects that were below that 10,000 square foot threshold mm -hmm. where an existing single family house was being modified into something like what we see a lot of now. So uh, in the beginning, it was just a few, but it over time became a huge number to the point our inspectors were being diverted to have to look into a lot of those. And what mainly got our attention in the beginning was the rerouting of drainages. So people who normally had never gotten direct flow from the adjacent property did after that adjacent property redeveloped, let's say a traditional ranch to a heavily developed uh, site, single family residential site. And there was really no permit mechanism to deal with that. So that led to a bona fide stakeholder group setting that involved council members, several council members, staff, the community, uh, Home Builders Association, various entities, and for, I guess, is about a year, they met on and off, and that's what bore out our current single-family residential stormwater permit. And that goes down much lower than the 10,000 square feet. Rebecca, help me how far that goes down. What? 800. 800. So it goes down much lower, so... Uh, they have to denote the drainage path and have to have some controls. Now, to, and I, I don't know this exact number because Kimberly Hayes' office oversees that, but I want to say they have since the early 2010s issued over 15,000 of those permits. And at any one time, they're juggling about 1,000 of those permits. And that program over time has evolved to be more inclusive. Of course, it's got some element of post-construction, so the degree to which you raise the imperviousness, your controls have to reflect and deal with that. So I just wanted to add that little context in light of what they're seeing, uh, just to make sure that you realize that there has been some effort made, and I'm not sure how many cities have that. I'm sure some of the bigger cities do, but that was a major step forward for Metro Nashville when we adopted that. Rebecca, is there anything you'd like to add to that? I know you're a reg guru. Uh, they did mention the tree credit that is part of the single family residential infill and, and we based it off of Portland because, well, it's Portland. And uh, unfortunately, a large canopy tree protected to its drip line takes up so much area on a lot that nobody wants to to protect that much space and lose that much buildable area so it's going to be interesting to see what hawkins can come up with from pure cities to see exactly how that could be applied to saving some large canopy in the city yeah and and from our perspective my understanding is kimberly hayes and her folks are being involved in this endeavor and working with planning as they as they look at that. So thank you. Thank you for those pieces. I think this is a long overdue and important piece as Nashville continues to grow into its next phase. It's nice that we almost had a lull in the growth to some degree to rethink and plan and strategize and be ready for, for the next uh, cycle. So thanks for staff for doing that. What is the outcome? for this to modify the stormwater management manual? We don't really know at this point. They mentioned the 
impervious surface ratio issue, which has been something that has been talked about over time, but never really implemented as far as a regulation. So I would imagine at some point there'll be some cooperative arrangement between planning and stormwater where we reconcile anything. We always have to reconcile things that planning and codes does with our regs. So I would assume that will happen in this case as well. But it sounds like they're just uh, getting to the point of trying to make some of those determinations. And not to continue to harp on it, but the, the other piece that would go with this is what we've discussed in a few meetings past where the compensatory mitigation program and metro properties and opportunity that may exist within um, uh, parks or metro properties or flood buyback areas that uh, could be uh, sources of mitigation efforts as part of this whole um, best management practice for variances and things of that nature. So, okay. Any other any other items of business? I wanted to talk about uh, next month's meeting. So it had been hard to find a room. I did find one. It is in Lindsley Hall, which is the building to the right of the Howard School. It is a lot smaller room, so it's more like a conference room type setup. I think what we'll probably have to do is essentially see, see cases one at a time, like walk applicants over there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's a small room. It's a closet. It's not. It, it is a conference room, maybe like the size of one at, at MOB, our building. So it's not really set up for public meetings, but they have recording capability in it. So that's yeah, kind of why I said it. It used to be a, down at 2nd Avenue North. Yeah. Well, yeah. Room. Yeah. So. Um, did, did, were there <laughs> applications submitted? Yeah, we, we do have a fee. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we will have a meeting next month, but I think that maybe pushes our compensatory mitigation discussion to October when we're back That's in fine. Sunny West. Uh, and that way we can have a little bit more public discussion. Yeah, good. So, Excellent. I'll send out, I'll send out the information. Um, it is on our campus. So that's kind of what I was trying to do. This room was taken, the school board was taken, Sunny West was taken. So I didn't want to push us to like Madison or something because that, yeah. or downtown, you know, I don't want to make everybody drive downtown if I don't have to. Um, I, I hope that the change of our meeting date potentially helps with that situation. I'm not sure if our... That'll start on October. So that'll help the yeah. room availability situation. Yeah, we've already got rooms booked through, I guess, April. What, I had a calendar last time. Wonderful. Year. Yeah. Okay. And we're trying to get that on the website as well. So I, I would add one note that we are about to be able to get into our new stormwater building, and we're looking at maybe having that as a permanent second choice for the committee meeting. So that is an option. We're still considering that. Uh, our new stormwater building? Maybe I'm the only one in the dark. We've had a capital project plan for years for stormwater building. Uh, we've normally been and have been out on County Hospital Road. Um, and then over the last few years, unfortunately, during the pandemic, that capital project has finally moved forward and we'll be getting a new facility where our former Metro Water Services facility was coming up. Uh, once that building is complete and we're in it, we'll arrange a tour for the commission to come by and take a look. Outstanding. All right. It has myriad stormwater control features. <laughs> I would hope that's, that sets a model uh, example for all stormwater development projects. The mothership. Outstanding. And we request is better than the pavers at 800. <laughs> <laughs> all right. With that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Great. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Thank you all. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.